Nancy and her friends are at a resort in the Virgin Islands. At the same time, a band called Woody and the Hot Rods are filming a music video. The band is made up of three people. The red-headed leader, Woody O'Neill, gorgeous flirty blonde, Tucker Dawson, and serious brunette, Ricky Angeles. Um, that sounds just like Nancy and her friends. Argo Funk Book Review, Argo Funk Book Review. Vincent the Tour Guide points out a dangerous area called the Devil's Chain, which has deadly mazes, underground caves, and traps. I am confident that Nancy will go there in the finale. She has to, right? It sounds awesome! Nancy tries to take a picture of her new friend Ava, when Ava's father knocks the camera out of her hands. Ava and her father leave the resort immediately, even though they just checked in today. Rather mysterious. The band arrives, Woody accidentally hits Nancy with his guitar case, and they joke around with each other. It's actually pretty cute. To the point where the book puts the story on hold for a few paragraphs, to remind everyone that Nancy has a boyfriend, she's very dedicated to Ned, there will be no vacation boyfriends today. Aww. Woody gets mad when he sees his ex-girlfriend Courtney with the resort manager, Stephen Gibbs. Later, Nancy overhears Gibbs and Ricky arguing. Ricky threatens to reveal what really happens at the resort if he doesn't see her, and Gibbs swears she'll be here soon. Nancy figures, well, this is a mystery, while Bess decides, no way, he probably has a secret girlfriend. Bess, were you even listening to that conversation? The band does a live show, which goes great until Gibbs attacks a cameraman. He says he's only protecting the privacy of the guests. None of them can be filmed. The band admits he's technically correct, they didn't get the people in the crowd to sign release forms, but geez, he didn't have to manhandle the cameraman to get that part cut out of the music video. Nancy goes snorkeling. Again, Nancy meets two people who immediately disappear without a trace. She remembers seeing them enter a secluded hut last night. Nancy goes inside and sees a bunch of camera equipment for taking official photos. Vincent chases her away with vague threats. Courtney and Woody get into an argument, and Nancy half-questions Gibbs. By that, I mean she goes to his office to question him, but she asks questions like, How did you meet the band? And did you know those two guys who left? She fails to ask the important questions, like, Why does Ricky think you're involved with a missing woman? And what's the terrible secret the resort is hiding? On a bike trip, Nancy realizes Woody is not guilty, he's just being a jealous ex-boyfriend. The, the Courtney thing just has him all wigged out. The culprit attempts to kill Ricky by cutting his brakes. Nancy saves Ricky's life by telling him to put his foot against the bike tire. It's a good death scene, but it's a bit of a culprit giveaway since there's only one person here who's not Nancy or a band member. At lunch, Ricky attempts to kill Courtney in a fit of rage. He's mad because Courtney's earrings are a distinctive family heirloom, which belonged to his sister. How did Courtney get his sister's earrings? Nancy tracks the source of the earrings down to Vincent, just as Vincent is attacked by the culprit. He spends the rest of the book unconscious in the hospital, because if he was awake, the mystery would be over. Nancy returns to the mysterious hut and uses her lockpicking kit to get inside. She finds a ledger with names and large dollar amounts. All of the missing guests are on the list. A culprit shows up and Nancy escapes through the back door. This leads to a cliffside tunnel and a secret boat dock. The culprit tries to kill Nancy by pushing a barrel down the path like it's a game of Donkey Kong. Nancy avoids death by hanging on to the outside of the railing. The next day, Woody and Courtney decide they don't care what the other band members think. They love each other, and they want to start dating again. Aww. Nancy and George return to the hut, but it's locked. Nancy decides they can't get inside, even though she picked the lock with her lock-picking kit nine pages ago. Continuity! So, because they can't get past the lock, they climb onto the roof. They wait a while and see the culprits taking photographs of people, which are put on U.S. immigration certificates. That's the crime. They're using falsified records to smuggle illegal immigrants into the United States. Instead of hiding the operation, the culprits let the illegal immigrants wander around the resort freely. Because, uh, they're stupid. 
Okay, fine. We're told it's an acclamation period, but really, it was just an excuse for the book to have three cliffhangers where people freak out and destroy cameras. George accidentally makes a noise, and the culprits look up, and they almost get caught by Gibbs, but Bess distracts him by playing dumb. Ricky confesses he paid $20,000 to sneak his sister Maria into the country. Bess and George leave for the Department of Immigration, while Nancy searches the resort. She learns Vincent keeps muttering Devil's Chain over and over again. Nancy goes there, and the culprits attack. The culprit is Gibbs, and a handful of resort employees. The entire book happened because Vincent and another employee went rogue. They accidentally killed Maria, and they've been trying to kill Ricky ever since just to cover up their mistake. They tie Nancy to a rock so she will drown when the tide comes in, but Nancy uses barnacles to cut the ropes. Blasted barnacles! It would be really cool if Nancy got to explore the deadly cave maze here, but she doesn't. She walks to the center of the island and uses a magnifying glass to start a fire. The Coast Guard rescues her immediately. She also finds Maria, who's not dead, she was just hiding. It's not the most exciting ending sequence ever. Especially since while this was happening, Gibbs hired someone to stab Bess and George. The cousins fought off the knife-wielding killer barehanded. I would have preferred reading that scene, to be honest. The end. Postbook follow-up. The main criticism against this book is that the first part is slow. Nancy doesn't do any investigation, and the cliffhangers are things like destroyed cameras and mild warnings. It's like the book was originally written for the Younger Readers Nancy Drew series. Things pick up halfway through once attempted murder enters the mix. I was fine with the first part of the book, but if you're not interested in the band, there's not much else to hold your attention. In fact, the back cover basically skips the first half of the book and goes directly to the murder stuff, so it's probably fair to say the book would be improved if the first half had been truncated, or if the deadly mystery started sooner. The band appears to be a main selling point for the book, but they're honestly not that interesting. I don't care about false rumors circulating a fictional band, especially when these rumors are months old. The cover scene shows an amplifier exploding, which would have been a cool death sequence. It's actually supposed to be an electrocution death. Ricky plays bass near a fountain, and his cord falls into the water. Nancy uses a wooden mallet to knock the cord out of the amp. I'm not entirely sure how the logistics of this scene work. If the cord is loose while it's still connected to an amp and a bass, maybe the cord has three ends. Overall, I half enjoyed the book. It's fine for casual reading. I was able to identify the culprit in the crime in the first half of the book, so for once I got to feel smarter than Nancy. Since the consensus is that half the book needs improvement, I give it half points. I give Nancy Drew Files number 58, Hot Pursuit, a 5 out of 10.